Welcome to this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizula. Joining me today is Dr. Hope Rugo, Professor of Medicine and Director of the Breast Oncology Clinical Trials Program at UCSF. Wonderful to have you here, Dr. It's Rugo. It's great to be here. I wanted to talk about managing HER2 positive disease from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Can you talk about the PERTAIN trial that looked at data on pertuzumab and trastuzumab along with an aromatase inhibitor, just to highlight the key findings of this particular trial? Yeah, it's an interesting trial, I think, uh, because I think it tells us something that they didn't really intend to tell us. But uh, it trials about 250 patients randomized with uh, HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer that also was estrogen receptor positive to receive trastuzumab and an aromatase inhibitor or trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and an aromatase inhibitor. So their question was, does pertuzumab add to that combination of trastuzumab and an AI? The problem is that uh, they, they did show an improvement of about three months in progression-free survival and the usual reasonably easily managed side effects from pertuzumab. But the thing is that we've seen a survival advantage of 15 months with adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab and ataxane as first-line therapy for metastatic HER2-positive breast cancer. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to start with hormone therapy unless you're too old and then you're still getting diarrhea from pertuzumab uh, for some very compelling reason, and it would be an unusual patient. But what I think it did tell us was that you can safely combine hormone therapy with the two antibodies. It just didn't tell us the question we really want to know, which is that if you get chemo, Herceptin, uh, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, and then you stop the chemo and continue the double antibody maintenance, which is what we do, yes. should you add back in hormone therapy? Because it asked about adding pertuzumab, but not the hormone therapy. So that's what we do anyway. In the Cleopatra trial that showed the survival advantage, they didn't give hormone therapy as maintenance, but we do. And this trial, I think, definitely told us it's an effective approach. Dr. Rugo, the summit trial looked at neratinib alode and neratinib with fulvestrin in herb B2 mutant disease. Was that studied in patients with HER2-positive disease? Well, it actually didn't test neratinib in HER2-positive disease. And that's a, a finesse point and a really good mm -hmm. one to bring up. So what this trial uh, is doing, it's a randomized phase two trial, um, it, and this was just an initial look at the data. Um, it's an international collaboration. And it's looking at patients who have what has been tested as HER2 normal disease. So HER2 mm -hmm. is a, uh, a gene which is amplified. So you get many copies of it. And then it translates into an increased protein expression on the cell surface. We found that there's a small percentage of tumors that have what are called somatic mutations in HER2. Mm -hmm. So they were looking for patients who had what's now referred to as herb b two mutations, because that's the gene name. Yes. So it's, it shouldn't be called HER2 gene mutations because of nomenclature. But uh, we still do it because it's a little easier to say. Yes. So the, it turns out that it's maybe 2 2.5% of the population of patients with breast cancer that's HER2 negative. And they don't test positive by FISH or oh. immunohistochemistry because they actually have mutations in the DNA. And there's some preclinical data that shows that these cancers would respond better to a potent oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor like neratinib. So Cynthia Ma and, uh, um, has been working for a long time and with Matt Ellis initially uh, before he left Washington University in St. Louis on studying this in patients who have mutations. And this is a sort of extension of that study. Their mm -hmm. trial did show that neratinib had activity in patients who have uh, yes. these uh, HER2 or ERB2 somatic mutations. It's just uncommon. So what we've discovered actually in the last year, and some of this was known before, but it's just important to define it clinically, is that you see these mutations much more frequently in patients who have a lobular histology in their cancer. Fascinating, right? Yes, And in that much. patient population, it's a less than 10%, but it's more common. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. If you have a patient who has a lobular cancer that's acting very hormone-resistant, this could be a treatment that would be important. 
What they did in their trial, a little bit different from Cynthia Ma's trial, is that they said, okay, you can either be randomized to neratinib as monotherapy or neratinib and fulvestrin, because these patients mm -hmm. mostly have ER positive lobular cancer. And they actually have a small number of patients, 25 patients in the neratinib arm, 17 in the combination arm with fulvestrin. But they showed responses in both groups. It's so early that they showed the responses as waterfall plots. Yeah. Um, and they don't have a durability, the duration of response. They just don't have enough information. So it's a very early look at this data, small numbers. But in a rare subtype of breast cancer, it shows that the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor is effective. And the fulvestrin and neratinib was effective. It's hard to tell any difference, actually, in the sure. small number of patients right now. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see what the ongoing data shows. Neratinib isn't available. So I think in the United States, if you found a patient who had a somatic mutation in HER2, you could definitely apply for compassionate use of neratinib sure. for that purpose. Um, as you know, there is extended adjuvant therapy in HER2-positive disease in the Extinet trial. Uh, with neratinib that showed a big benefit in ER-positive, centrally confirmed HER2-positive disease. So the drug is at the FDA, and so there'll be some uh, decisions on it in 2017. So we might have the drug available, but if not, I would try and go to the company Puma for compassionate use oh, in that sure. setting. And otherwise, there are trials going on. And some people have tried standard HER2-targeted therapy. We just don't know yet if it's going to work in this population of patients with HER2-somatic mutations. It's too early at this stage. We well, the numbers are small. Yes. We've learned to look more at lobular cancer, and you have to do sequencing to find it. So sure. there are a number of reasons why it's been sort of slow to develop. But it is exciting it is. to think you could even a small pick out yeah. a small number of patients sure. and target a mutation. Absolutely. So on a broader note, though, do you feel like we might be moving away from cytotoxic chemotherapy in some of these patients? Well, there was another uh, presentation, actually, at San Antonio uh, by one of our colleagues from Spain, Alex Pratt, and he took patients who were on the PAMELA trial, mm -hmm. a neoadjuvant study where patients received trastuzumab, lapatinib, and if they were ER positive, a hormone agent. And that trial already reported its results, but what he did was he looked at the tumor tissue with intrinsic subtyping. There's a subtype that's very common called HER2 enriched, where there's increased signaling. And you have a, patients who got a regimen that had no cytotoxics. And in the HER2 enriched group, which people have shown is very, sen this subgroup is exquisitely sensitive to chemotherapy and HER2 targeted therapy. But, and he showed about a 39% or so response rate of pathologic complete response mm -hmm. in patients just receiving the two biologics. But it turns out that if you give chemotherapy and two biologics, even one, mm -hmm. to patients who have HER2 enriched disease, you can get a pathologic CR rate of 70%. So I think that we're not going to abandon cytotoxics yet. Uh, we just, you know, the responses are so good, and sure. you get such a great survival, and the treatment is reasonably well tolerated, it's yes. hard to abandon it. That makes complete sense. And we want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, and for trying to assimilate that data for us and present it in a way that's very clear to our audience. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for this practice update. I'm Dr. Farzana Hafizullah.